Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books Radio. Audiobooks.com is the chief underwriter for Good Books Radio, which is produced by UTRGV Media Services for Rio Grande Valley Public Radio. And now, here's your host, Dr. John Cook. Welcome once again to another edition of Good Books Radio. I'm your host this week, Dr. John Cook, and with me today is Ms. Jennifer Patterson. She's a writer, creative, and herbalist who uses words, threads, and plants to explore queer survivorhood the body, and healing. The editor of this anthology we're talking about today, she also facilitates writing and embroidery workshops and has had writing published in Ocho, a journal of queer arts, hand job design, and the Outrider Review, and on the Feminist Wire. With a past life in fashion design, she now uses her hands to embroider, map, and mark the body through movable states of disembodiment. She is also an herbalist who centers queer and trans trauma and survivorhood in her practice through her apothecary, corpus ritual. Jennifer is also finishing a graduate program at Goddard College focusing on trauma, embodiment, queer communities, healing, craft, loss, pleasure, pain through creative nonfiction. You can find more at ofthebody.net. The book is Queering Sexual Violence, Radical Voices from Within the Anti-Violence Movement. And this is a this is a powerful work by a lot of people who've been through some interesting things. Let's let's start uh, Jennifer, if we, oh, well, by the way, welcome to the program. Sorry about that. Thank you. Thank um, you so much for having me. Uh, let's start by uh, getting some clarity around a couple of things. Uh, first of all, queering sexual violence. Several of your writers talk about the fact that a lot of those rallies that protest uh, violence against women focus on cisgender, Christian, white, often virgin women. And um, that they talk about that with some disdain because it leaves out a whole lot of people. Yeah. So is that uh, th- that sort of gives us a hint about what what the title of this book represents? Queering sexual violence. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think um, you know the intention of the book and the the contributors in it really represent a larger um, swath of people who have experienced sexual violence, and it's not just narrowed down. Um, into violence against women, which violence against women is um, the gender-based framework for kind of approaching and acknowledging and responding to um, violence, including sexual violence. But yeah, it's, it's often centered on cisgender women, cisgender being um, women who their sense of personal identity and gender corresponds with the sex that they were assigned at birth. And so it, you know, it leaves out transgender women, it leaves out gender non-conforming people, it leaves out cisgender and transgender men, it really leaves out a lot of people from the larger conversation. Mm -hmm. And and a lot of these folks are at the margins of society because of their gender or their race or their sexuality or their economic or immigration or sex worker status. Um, Yeah. And so um, how how society defined a legitimate victim is part of the issue that some of these people are talking about. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like you had mentioned and people mentioned in the book, you know, this this legitimate or this idea of a perfect victim is often um, a cisgender white woman who's heterosexual, middle to upper class, um, kind of doing all the right things and still, you know, manages to get herself raped is the idea. And so, um, you know, this book is pushing back on that a lot. And a lot of that is reinforced through the media. And I think like, you know, like a an example that's relevant, slightly different, is that, that the white yoga teacher woman who was murdered in Minneapolis by the police, and, you know, the media kind of took that and ran with it and painted her as this innocent and perfect victim, which, you know, is really dishonoring so many people who are, you know, people of color and who also are experiencing murder and violence by the police, but, like, experience themselves and their lives being diminished in, in their murders. Mm-hmm. And a lot of that happens in sexual violence as well, you know, like depending on who you are and how you experience the violence, there's a lot of ways that people kind of try to erase or diminish the experiences that we, we go through. Mm-hmm. You uh, make a point, and so do some of your contributors, that um, uh, the term survivor is a better use than the term victim for sexual violence. we we'll talk about that a bit. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think... I think that's like a, there's so many different answers to this question and and people feel really different. I mean, some people are comfortable calling themselves victims. Some are comfortable calling themselves survivor. There's one contributor, Emily Coulter Thompson, who actually uses the word thriver, which kind of just honors moving beyond just like mere survival 
and then other people find thriver you know limiting or you know like just like more pressure to get to another place in their survivorhood when they're they're already doing the best that they can Mm -hmm. um and contributor Ruth Ariel actually breaks down this binary too, like because it is a binary. There's, you know, people have very specific ideas of what a victim is and what a survivor is, and so she interviewed a bunch of people that she knew, and the feedback from people was that when they heard the word victim, they immediately thought weak, helpless, broken, injured, quiet, dead, you know, like not surviving. And survivors were seen as strong and powerful and resilient and speaking up and whole and alive. And so there's even just in that binary, there's, you know, like resistance to wanting to be a victim and we want to be a survivor. And I think, again, like that binary is really limiting to a lot of people because, you know, we feel different every single day and sometimes we aren't thriving or surviving. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so I think it's, again, it's just something that's like, it's really, I use the word survivor just as kind of a catch-all, but, you know, a lot of people have different feelings about those words. And uh, some survivors actually become perpetrators. That's talked about by a couple of contributors. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, I think that harm and violence is on this huge continuum. And I think, you know, I think a lot of, um, you know, the ways that, we're all raised and if we're raised in homes with extreme violence or extreme emotional abuse um, or sexual abuse you know that's that's our that's our sense of what love is that's our sense of like what relationship is and connection and I think like you know unknowingly a lot of people perpetuate a lot of harmful things in adult in adulthood and adult relationships and I think you can unlearn those things you know we're not talking about like raping partners or something I'm talking about maybe more like emotional violence Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I think that like, there are a lot of people that experience, you know, sexual violence and then also go on to, you know, sexually violate people in their adulthood. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also, you know, I, I think what's great about this book is that, you know, there are a lot of people talking about this and really complicating the narratives of, as well. And, um, back to that person I had mentioned, Ruth Ariel. She's a prison abolitionist and a death row lawyer, and she, in her piece, she talks about um, this person, John Doe, who was on death row and had committed sexual and other forms of violence while he was incarcerated. And, you know, it's it, she kind of speaks to the idea that, like, once we know that someone has committed violence, um, that's what they are. They're, they're perpetrators, they're abusive, they're violent. And the other part of his story is that while he was incarcerated, he experienced a ton of sexual abuse and violence from other people that were incarcerated, from staff, and there was no, there was no room for that part of his story, and there was no acknowledgement of like the care that he might need to be moving through his own experiences with violence. Um, and so, yeah, it just really, I think that that does happen, and I also think it's also really complicated, and there's a lot of um, ways that violence people experience just gets completely erased from their histories and their narratives. Mm-hmm. You, you mentioned that sexual violence is a tool of intimidation and control in our prison system, and it's interesting that some people are looking to abolish prisons. I think uh, we're a long way from that in this society, and that's too bad. But uh, uh, intimidation and control are not the what we usually think of in association with sexual violence, but especially the staff, that mm-hmm. seems to be something they engage in. Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of reports coming out of the levels of sexual violence and um, assault by prison staff on people that are incarcerated. Um, there's this great organization called Black and Pink, which is a collab- it's a collective that supports incarcerated people, LGB- LGBTQ people and their allies and families. And they had a study come out in 2015, I believe, called Coming Out of, the Con- Coming Out of Concrete Closets. Um, and they shared a ton of information and statistics around the levels of sexual violence, but some of what they shared was that 70% of LGBTQ prisoners surveyed had experienced discrimination or verbal harassment, while a third of respondents had been sexually assaulted by other prisoners. Um, And all the prisoners who filled out the survey reported being strip-searched daily, which is also a form of sexual violence. Um, that often doesn't get acknowledged, you know, outside of people working directly with um, incarcerated populations. Mm -hmm. A lot of these uh, um, survivors are victims of child molestation, 
and uh, hor horrible stories to be told there. But s several of them mention that if you're molested as a child, you're more likely to be raped as an adult than people who were not. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the stats for that are really high as well. And I kind of, I tend to kind of, I know about the statistics, but I think, again, like so many people are left out of statistics as well. So, you know, what, what we're seeing is like a portion of the reality. Um, but yeah, there's, there's been a ton of studies that, that the levels of re-victimization from childhood to adulthood are really, really high. Um, and yeah, a lot of people a lot of people are experiencing sexual violence both in childhood and in adulthood. Mm -hmm. um, one, of, one of your contributors is, is a lesbian culture worker who tells a story of survival of incest and rape fondled by her grandfather at a young age of 12, raped by a man in Mexico. And she mentioned something that actually a couple of the different authors mentioned. She's often asked if that's why she's a lesbian, because she um, suffered sexual violence. Um, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and some people in, who've written in your book actually say they think that contributed to their gender choice, and others say that shouldn't even be thought of as a factor. So it's both sides yeah. of the coin, yes? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, that's kind of what, that was my intention in putting the book together was that you know, we all have a multitude of experiences. And I, I kind of, I, when I started working on the book, I came from the perspective of like, no, this is not why I'm queer. But, um, you know, it was really, it was important to me that I had a lot of different perspectives. And so things that conflicted with that as well. And yeah, the, the contributor you're talking about is Aisha Shahida Simmons. Um, and she, she says in her piece too, which I think is really important to remember that um, if molestation and rape made women and girls lesbians, than most of the girls and women in the world would be lesbians. Just mm. check the global statistics on molestation, rape, and other forms of violence against mm. women. Um, and so, yeah, you know, like there's people that are um, saying that there is a link, and then there's people that are saying there isn't a link. And again, it's like one of those things that each survivor gets to decide for themselves. Mm -hmm. But it is a really common question. I mean, it's a question that I've had people you know, like directly ask me and also just make assumptions around me and, and my sexual identity and my, you know, my, the partners that I choose to be with. And it's a really common thing. It's people just automatically kind of pathologize it and make that direct link. Mm -hmm. and, and surviving the trauma is, is handled in different ways. One of your contributors talks about being grabbed uh, by a man and raped and then later is describing in, in very much detail her lesbian lover with a strap on grabbing her uh, strongly, just and, and an analogous to the rape, but this was one she chose and enjoyed. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, I think you're talking about. There's a number of pieces in the book that talk about BDSM and kink as a way to kind of move through traumatic memory and and kind of take ownership over experiences. And I think that there's there's a lot of misinformation around BDSM and kink and you know, the, the main the main tenant of it is that it's consensual and it's chosen and there's, like, you know, rules and kind of, like, regulations around what's acceptable and okay and allowed. Um, and I think for some people, like, it can be really powerful to kind of rewrite the narrative and and take some some, some control back and make a, a personal choice around something that they, they didn't have choice around before and to do it in, like, a loving partnership with someone that they trust and care for. Yeah, we, we've had a, an author of a book on BDSM on the show, um, and they have their own experience of coming out to folks that they, you know, they, mm. they acknowledge that they're in that. But what I, I was fascinated by in this book is the notion that no means no. That you can say yeah. yes or no to anything. You have you have safe safe words, which is something we don't have in a sexual violence situation. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One interesting character who obviously touched your heart a bit is Chloe, who's a, a an excellent satirical uh, cartoon artist mm. uh, and a victim of uh, the medication she was taking for her AIDS. Uh, tell yeah. us a little bit about Chloe. Uh, Chloe, yeah, Chloe and I were, we met through mutual friends quite some time ago, um, and she's an artist, I mean, she was, like, very well-known and kind of like a downtown New York City celebrity, an artist, a writer, an activist, um, and she called herself a long-term survivor living with HIV and AIDS, um, and we, yeah, we had met and, you know, kind of talked about her contributing something to the anthology, and she'd wanted to write some new work, 
um, and do some new artwork. And she ended up passing, I think, about a year into working on the anthology. And so she didn't ever get to, to, to do any new work for it. Um, and I was fortunate to kind of continue the conversation with her partner and some friends who um, were like allowed me to get access to some of her work as she had she had wanted to contribute it and so it was really important to me that she was still able to contribute even though she wasn't you know here with us on this plane mm-hmm. there's um, there's one person who uh, who talks about um, the fact that she who who was LGBTQ I think she was uh, she had a queer community and she was just certain that that queers don't do sexual violence mm-hmm. um, but that well, I think didn't that yeah. turn out to be the case yeah I mean I think I think that's a lot you know a lot of people kind of carry that idea I mean even when I came out and started being in queer relationships a lot of people were like were they felt like oh like you'll be safe there oh good you'll be safe and it's I mean that's not the case there's um, plenty of sexual violence within queer communities and again it race it erases people's experiences and it makes you know it makes it really difficult to come forward around the sexual violence you experience if you're being told that like people like queer people don't do that or like gay people don't do that um yeah and it's it, it's problematic mm-hmm so um, there's some really ugly physical abuse descriptions throughout the throughout the book, um, and one in particular that came to mind is the uh, the young lady. I think she was Puerto Rican who um, had to tell her mother had to tell her mother about something. And you know, it sounds like she's coming out, but what she told her mother prompted her mother to call social workers and psychologists, and and uh, what she was coming out about was the fact that her father had raped her hundreds of times as a child. Mm. Oh, yeah, that's Amida Slavine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think a lot of people play with the idea of coming out in this book and, um, like, what it means to kind of inhabit multiple identities that you have to reveal to people or share with people and how those things can kind of, you know, they shape and inform each other, but they're not always what people think. And yeah, like they talk about their first experience of coming out was having to come out about the sexual violence they did, and other forms of violence they had been experiencing through um, their relationship with their father. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and there was also a tale of uh, one who uh, her father abused the mother quite a bit as well as her, and um, uh, the mother had fallen down the stairs pregnant with a boy and had lost the baby boy but mm. had the baby girl, which her father didn't want. Her father didn't want a girl. And yeah. uh, so suffered a lot of abuse just because she was female. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the book is not, it's it's not short on <laughs> hardship. It's a it's a really complicated book. Um, and it's, you know, it's it's graphic at times. And I think, you know, I think that it's important in some way for people to kind of, if, if it feels supportive, to really, like, share the details of the violence they've lived through, because I think there's, like, a transformation and a healing that can occur in writing something and having it, you know, concrete on paper. But, yeah, there's, I mean, there's no end to it mm-hmm. <laughs> in the book. Yeah. Um, and I should note for our, our listeners that this is this is a great read by a lot of contributors, and although there are plenty of essays and, and stories being told there's also some poetry as well as the artwork of chloe uh so there's a lot of different things that uh would draw one to this book not just the stories the graphic stories that are in here uh some beautiful poetry and in in particular uh, talks about you know how people cope and actually the whole book is about how people cope yeah i mean i think it's you know, I've had a lot of people, I, I've been very inside of it for so long, and I've heard from so many people reading it that sometimes they just read a piece at a time or, you know, little bits to kind of take it in more slowly. And I do think, you know, like it is a complicated and a hard book to read, and also it's it feels like liberatory to me and it feels healing to me to hear people, you know, like share their experiences and share the ways that they're continuing to survive. Mm-hmm. Um And also, you know, survival is not a, which a lot of people speak about, survival is often not a one-time thing. And I think it's important, too, to 
kind of push back on the narrative that like, you know, a terrible event happens, sexual violence ha- happens once, and then you're just in the rest of your life healing. And I think so many people, be- you know, because of their their race or their class or their sexuality or their, you know, so many different reasons, their, the, the violence they experience is ongoing and regular. And so um, how do you how do you navigate healing when it's, you know, happening all of the time? And I think that's this book speaks a lot to that and shares a lot of ways that people are doing that. I would be a poor uh, interviewer who ignores current events if I didn't mention this. We're in the first week in August, and it was recently that President Trump tweeted that he would no longer support transgender in the military because of the cost of sex change yeah. operations. And the general sort of pushed back on that. What's your take on all that? Ooh, I mean, <laughs> I have, again, another very complicated uh, situation. I mean, I'm not a I'm not a fan of the military. I I'm a prison abolitionist, and I would love if the military didn't exist too. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, you know, that aside, I think, you know, from what I've heard from, you know, a lot of the think pieces that have come out after that, there's something like fifteen thousand trans people employed by the military. Um, and I've also worked. I've done a lot of writing workshops in many different places, and I've done um, writing workshops at veterans hospitals and with people that are you know, um, veterans just outside of hospitals in different spaces. And, you know, like the the levels of sexual violence within the military are extremely high. And, you know, people join the military for different reasons, a lot of times trying to escape, you know, the place that they are raised and grow up in. And so, yeah, I just think it's a very, we could talk about that all day, probably. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I, I think it's, terrible and also it's you know we want so much more than just inclusion in the military we want you know like true liberation inclusion Um, in the rest of society as well yeah yeah i mean it's one of the places that we're often excluded and also it's you know like it's it's much bigger than that and on the so-called fake media um (laughs) One reporter was talking about talking to someone uh, who was familiar with the transgender community by being a transgender veteran who said, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Trump's making a case that uh, everybody has has this expensive surgery and not all transgender people have surgery. Some uh, some folks uh, take hormones and that's the extent of their uh, trans transformation. Yeah, that's just a like. It's a red herring or so. I don't know. It's like a, I mean, I think there was also stuff that came out that the military spends more on Viagra than anything. So it's kind of like, what are we actually talking about here? (laughs) Like, I really like trans people who want to get surgery. One, it's not my business. And two, um, I don't like, it's just not, it's just a non-issue. It's really, I don't think it's the thing that's like costing the military billions and millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, one author wrote a, a chapter called Queering Healthy Sexuality. Uh, this this book uh, explores several realms of not only violence but sexuality. Um, mm. Society frowns on, or, or heteronormative, Christian, white <laughs> society frowns on, on sexuality in general, not just queer yeah. sex, right? I mean, it, yeah. it seems to me that the Orthodox religion of sort of vilified sex in general. Yeah, for sure. And this is, uh, uh, in some ways, a pushback against that. Yeah, you're talking about um, Emily Coulter Thompson's piece. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, she kind of just unpacks the ways that, you know, heterosexuality is enforced and kind of um, expected of, of people from a young age and really how that shapes um you know, access to knowing your own sexuality in a different way or feeling like you can access it in a way that feels more authentic to you. Mm-hmm. But, but even... And she's, yeah, she's... Sorry, go ahead. Uh, you go, no, you go ahead. <laughs> well, I was going to say, she's also the person that she speaks to um, when I was talking about Thriver, like using Thriver. And so she she's also trying to kind of use, you know, kind of push the idea that, like, there's a there's a place to land beyond just mere survival and it's it's thriving, which, you know, some, again, some people find limiting and some people find expensive Mm -hmm. to think about. Well, I think that for some, even, uh, 
even heterosexual sex is, is a taboo. There's a discussion in there by one of your authors about how someone 10 years old got her period and she was 12 and still didn't have hers. And uh, her father, being the macho father that he was, su- suggested that there's a difference in blood that comes from a woman's um, vagina and uh, other kinds of blood that represent valor. That blood represents something dirty, something disgusting, something sinful. And mm. that, that sort of uh, uh, reflects a lot of what society has, uh, even heterosexual sex as being. Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Who is your, uh, the lady yeah. that wrote your foreword, um, she, she, she wrote a, a, a great foreword for you. Oh, yeah. That's Raina Gossett. Mm-hmm. She's, a, um, she's a filmmaker and writer and artist and activist, and she's, yeah, she's amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, she, she mentioned uh, uh, people of color who were homeless and worked in the sex trade and have AIDS and are incarcerated, and um, there's just a, a whole lot of marginalized people in our society that are that are uh, uh, having difficulty m- m- surviving because of how they're treated in society. Yeah, yeah. I mean. She also, it's not in this book, but some of her, one of the things that she's done is um, this work around thinking about how no one is disposable, which, you know, is kind of connected to prison abolition and connected to um, transformative justice and just thinking about, you know, like, if I don't want to be disposable, nobody else can be disposable. So that means that, like, everybody's experiences are valid and need to be honored and need to be, you know, like, we need to be building community and care for people that... Are, that need healing and that need access to um, so many different things and that are often so pushed down and erased and marginalized within larger society. It was just a, a little bit more about your, your biography is so interesting because of how you approach uh, uh, supporting people who've, who've suffered trauma. Um, what, what do you think has been some of the best work that you've done with that? Yeah, I mean, I, I when I started working on this book, um, I kind of started moving more into healing work, which is, again, healing is a lifelong journey. But um, and I've done, yeah, I've done it in a couple different ways. I've, I've I'm an herbalist, so I work with people with plants and supporting them um, around trauma, PTSD, mental health, um, addiction, and I also facilitate breathwork sessions, which are it's kind of like a like an active meditation, um, and it's really it really helps people connect to like an embodied experience and like a larger sense of knowing that we we hold in our bodies, which can also help shape the ways that we hold trauma and move through trauma. Um, and I do writing workshops that are trauma focused, which for me as a writer who often writes about trauma, you know, I felt kind of like. And, and I felt like many people had told me in different ways that, like, memoir or, like, writing about personal experience isn't really real writing, even though, like, that's what most of us are doing when we're writing is translating our own experiences or people we know into fiction or nonfiction. Um, and so I just wanted to have spaces for people to kind of know that they could come and write about what they needed to write about and hopefully move through some of their experience and, and, and experience being witnessed by other people in their work. Um, and those have been really powerful for me. I really enjoy being in those spaces with people. And, you know, it's there's something really special about being in survivor spaces that are led by and, and with other survivors. Because we kind of, even if we have different experiences, we have like kind of like a shared knowing that we're able to, to hold in a room with each other. Mm-hmm. We've been talking with Jennifer Patterson, who is a writer and editor of a book called Queering Sexual Violence, a very interesting read and well worth your time. You can find more at ofthebody.net. That's unfortunately all the time we have today, though. I remind you that if you don't hear our regularly scheduled broadcast on your particular NPR affiliate, you can catch us on YouTube at Good Books Radio. I'm your host, Dr. John Cook. Thanks for listening.